Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly discussion series that's hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with University of Michigan Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, and CMN TV. Today, our special guest is Dr. Atid Miri. Hello. Nice having you today. Yeah, greetings. Thank you for hosting me. And uh, Dr. Miri is a former professor of chemistry, and he's currently director of projects at the Chaldean Community Foundation. Um, and he's been active in many different communities, uh, Iraqi American communities in Michigan. So we're very happy to have him here today. Um, Dr. Miri, I would first like to know a little bit about your history. Uh, you know, where were you born and when you came to the United States and uh, what was your life like in Iraq? Well, thank you, Yam. Uh, first, um, my name is Avid Yusuf Meri. Um, I was born in Baghdad, uh, December 12, 1948. I was uh, schooled there until I finished uh, uh, my bachelor's degree in sciences uh, in Baghdad. I lived all my life, actually, in Baghdad, uh, where I was born. Um, I'm a member of a family of uh, seven. Uh, I'm the youngest. And uh, after I was schooled uh, in Iraq and graduated, I went to Britain, where I finished a PhD program at uh, London University uh, called Brunel. Uh, thereafter, I worked uh, at uh, King's College London uh, for a period of time. And then uh, I was a young uh, scientist, much like many of my generation in the mid-70s, and um, was recruited by the government of Iraq at the time to go back and uh, kind of put the country back together. We were like the scholars, the, the upcoming generation. I did uh, for two reasons, mostly because pressure from the family who wanted me to go back. Uh, and uh, I was appointed uh, at uh, a university in Basra, uh, the main university there. And I uh, worked there for uh, six years until the Iran-Iraq war erupted in 1981. And we were under constant shelling. The campus was only 10 kilometers away from the Iranian border. Many of my students were being killed uh, while they are crossing the Shat al Arab waterway to come to campus. So I decided to leave that summer and came to the United States in 1981 and um, was going to go to, um, uh, to industry at that time. Uh, there was transition uh, from the Carter administration to Reagan. It was tough economic times. I was going to work at Park Davis in the Midland, but then uh, the family wanted to stay in Detroit. So I became a businessman. I abandoned academia. I became a businessman, a bad one, but uh, that was a, uh, a marker uh, in history. So I've been here since 1981. And like you alluded earlier, I've been very active in the community, and we can touch upon that during the discussion. Wow, oh, that is very fascinating um, that you went through all of that. And obviously, you have brought your expertise, a lot of it, and your connection to Iraq here to the United States. And we're very grateful for that. Um, and, you know, some of that, when I say that you brought this forth currently, is because you write a lot for the Chaldean News. And you um, offer a lot of information regarding the Chaldeans history, their present, even you talk about their future. And you also write about Chaldeans all over the world. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved um, in that area where you are now trying, I don't know, document, preserve uh, the Chaldean history and, and culture? What is it exactly is your goal and how did you get involved in that? Yes. Um... The fact is, although I'm a scientist by background, uh, I'm a chemist, uh, but uh, I was born in a house of a very educated people from top to bottom. Uh, each and every one of my uh, siblings was distinguished in one way or the other. Uh, so was my father, uh, who was a scholar who spoke four languages, has many books that uh, we have shared in the past uh, that are alive till today. So I come from a very educated family. In fact, uh, sometimes uh, People ask me, look, uh, you are a scientist. What takes you uh, to culture, to history, uh, to tradition? So I tell them, you know, uh, there is a story that when I was born uh, in Baghdad at uh, that time, as you know, there were no uh, hospitals as we see them today. Most uh, actually uh, birth uh, places were in homes. So I 
say that my mom and the uh, uh, lady that was assisting at the time uh, did not have the proper uh, clothing for me, so they wrapped me with a newspaper. And so it's imprinted uh, on my body. It's a language, actually, whether it's Arabic, English, and it fascinates me. I, I am a, a, an advocate uh, of languages. I think languages are uh, one of the most powerful instruments that a human being can have. And accordingly, uh, I, my fascination uh, was not just to absorb and read and, and, uh, and think uh, of what we are reading, but really is how to transmit that. How do you transition it to the other people so that it has value? So I started writing, uh, and I have written in Arabic many, many articles in the past. But as you know, with technology um, arriving at our doorsteps, it became easy to uh, write in multiple languages, uh, to share it in different platforms. Uh, and when, uh, when I started here at the foundation, uh, this great place about three years ago, uh, I was asked to write about things that I was going through. For example, I make several trips to Iraq, to the Nineveh Plain, to the villages. And so I write my observations. I'm also interested in photography. So I always, uh, as you know, uh, photography is, is an important uh, visual component of what we do today. And because really it freezes the moment. When you take a picture, that moment is frozen forever. And uh, so a combination of uh, visual impact, pictures, videos, writings, uh, makes a compelling story uh, to, to, to uh, share with the new generation. So my fascination actually uh, was not by chance, uh, it was deliberate, uh, it took uh, quite some time. And like you said, uh, we am, I write principally about the community, about the traditions, about the history. And of course, uh, I always say we must have a third eye. Two eyes are not sufficient in today's world. And the third eye is looking for the future. So I look down that corridor as well uh, as I'm writing for today. So you mentioned about your dad uh, being a scholar. Uh, when we visited last time, because you were part of, uh, you participated in our digital storytelling project. And um, I was so fascinated about the story that you told about your dad writing the Aramaic books. Can you share that with us? Yes, uh, gladly. Actually, there's another story which we didn't share last time, but I'd like to, to mention it because it's really the reason why you and I are having this discussion. And it is about my father. Um, in the old days, in the villages, the eldest member of the family generally would become either a priest or at least a deacon. In 19... 11, my father was a youngster, 15 years old uh, or so, he went and uh, wanted to become a priest. And he actually was in his final year in 1914 when Gavrielo Princip, a Serbian nationalist, killed the Archduke of Austria, causing World War I. Well, what does that have to do with what we are talking about? Well, it has a lot. Because that incident, World War I incident, led to famine in the Middle East and many parts of the world. So the seminary told all the youngsters, including my father, and I have a very beautiful picture from that time, 1914, all these students with the bishops and the clergy in Mar Oraha uh, Monastery. They said, go back to the village, come back when the war ends. Many of my father's colleagues, like who became uh, uh, either bishops or uh, deacons or uh, uh, priests, uh, Shekhu, Babana, Kadu, they went back after the war ended. Well, my father got married. And because of that marriage, you see me talking to you. So my father, as a result of his education, his commitment, spoke Aramaic. In fact, he was a scholar in that field. And Arabic. And again, he was an Arabic teacher spoke French and spoke English. His love and affection and devotion to, to, to his past and to the Catholic traditions and to, to the language which he loved because his father was equally a uh, competent linguist and his grandfather was probably uh, uh, the, the benchmark for the family uh, because he was a calligrapher, much like my father was, 
And many of his pieces are found today at the British Museum, at the Berlin Museum, and they were documented very nicely in a book by Khairi Fumia, and uh, which is uh, uh, this book. I, I recommend everyone to have a copy of it. And in it, uh, these um, uh, uh, these pages you can see that are at the museums now. Okay, uh, written in Aramaic in color. So my father. Um, it started with the Chaldean language. So he brought the principal books that are taught in every primary school, Christian school in Iraq, and uh, they are about the principles of learning Chaldeans. It was, uh, there were four uh, different issues, uh, one, two, three, and four. And then, of course, he also published books about not just reading, but for example, Saum al Kabir. Uh, this is uh, one of his books uh, about uh, the uh, uh, fasting season, the Easter season. Uh, he also, in fact, I'm going to turn this a uh, little bit here to show you a selection of uh, his books, uh, which include Kens al Ibadah, Saum al Kabir, Khidmat al Qaddas, How to Serve Mass, and uh, then Al Han Sa'anin, uh, all these hymns that are sung during the masses. Uh, and uh, the beauty about all of this, he put all of this not just in Aramaic, not just in Syriac Chaldean, but he also put it in Arabic and in what we call Gershuni. Gershuni is when you read Aramaic in Arabic. So this way, uh, people in Baghdad, for example, the young people didn't know how to read Chaldean. So he made it easier for them. And so this commitment to, to the books, uh, to history, uh, was a part and parcel uh, uh, of, of his affinity to our community. And in fact, this is my father at the doors of our old home in Baghdad, and he always has a rosary in his hand and a book. Um, he, was, uh, he was a great uh, uh, reader and a great teacher. And we're very proud of him, uh, of course, as a family. So, so you can see the impact of language, which we can touch upon also later on, uh, uh, on the community. By the way, many of these books, uh, in fact, we donated everything to the church. And we said, uh, this is in Baghdad, and said, look, you print them, you make the money, and just give it to the church. Uh, here in the United States, many of these books were picked up by uh, devoted uh, uh, people like uh, Abuna or Khuri Stefan Kalabat, who reprinted uh, Kenz al Ibadah, which is the gem of the books, and uh, he distributed this free for many people. It's a great book. It has almost every prayer we have. You see it a lot in our churches. Um, you also mentioned that um, at that time they did not have the characters, the Aramaic characters, and so. Can you share what system they use in order to make the book? Yes, uh, this is also another fascinating story. Well, uh, my father, after uh, leaving Mosul in 1925, he went back to Baghdad. In Baghdad, of course, he's committed to going to church. He goes to church twice a day. And uh, at that time, Iraq was becoming a new nation in 1932. Uh, just before and thereafter, there were many missionaries coming from Germany, from uh, France, from Italy, from England. And these missionaries and the United States, by the way, and many of them established schools. They wanted to not only learn about Islam, learn about Iraq, uh, but they had interest in archaeology, in history, in languages. So my father became the first principal of the first uh, school, uh, boys' school in Baghdad in 1931. Well, during that relationship, uh, learning, uh, speaking with Americans, uh, you know, he spoke, as I said, uh, fluent English. Uh, he mentioned to some of them, they said, you know what, I, I am writing these books, but the print shops here don't have the uh, characters. Uh, there are no facilities here to publish them. Do you know any, any way? Well, one of the uh, people, uh, Principal Stout, said to him, you know, I know some British people, they're, they're the colonial people that were ruling back the, uh, Iraq at the time. I know somebody who can help you. So he goes to this British commander, and the British commander says, you know, uh, Mr. Mary, I, I served in India. And 
I've seen these letters in India. He said, where? He said, well, in West India and in Malabar, and by the way, Malabar province has over 8 million Chaldeans who to this day conduct mass. You can see it on uh, YouTube um, in our uh, liturgy, in our Chaldean language. So he said, I've seen the letters there. Well, my, he said, well, how do we do it? He said, well, what I'd like you to do is to write in, in your own handwriting the books, and we will send these pages to India, and they will make plates, plates. These were metal plates uh, put on wood, much like you see in stamps today, if you go to Secretary of State, if they are to stamp something, and we'll bring them back. And then we'll go the old way, we take pages, and you know we stamp them one by one. Well, as a young kid, me and my sisters, my siblings, we used to sit in a long table, uh, dinner table around the house, my father supervising, and we were stamping pages, each one. And if I show you some of our old books, which I still have few actually, and I will donate those uh, perhaps to the museum, the pages were not uniform. So, I mean, you know, I was a, I was a young kid, so my hand was weak, so I would stamp maybe 15 degrees to the right, my sister 15 degrees to the left. So when you look at these pages, really they were not done uh, professionally as you would see in a book today, but they are part of our history. And so then when my father passed away, we donated all of the plates again to the church. Uh, they're sitting somewhere in a museum, I think in one of the churches in Baghdad. So, uh, you know, I mean, look, if you have passion for some, something, if you have a commitment to do something, you will find a way. And I'm always fascinated by how Iraqis, they always find a way, whether artists, writers, scholars, um, no matter what, they always come up with these interesting inventions to create things, despite whatever their political or religious or economic situation. And I really love this story because he ended up making a book out of it in a very unique way. Um, and when I looked at them, they're just so authentic. I mean, they're such antiques that something that just they're treasures really at this point. Um, and well, you know, you know, uh, you know uh, there is something uh, I'd like to to connect with here. Um, you know, it's in our genes. You know, we when I say although Iraq is a new terminology, uh, but we are Mesopotamian. We are Aramaic people. It's in our genes. Uh, we are the Sumerians. We are the indigenous people of Iraq. We are the descendants of the Sumerians and the uh, Babylonians and, and uh, first the Akkad Akkadians and then the Babylonians. And it is in our gene. And there is a say in history that the spark always comes from Iraq. Um, you know, when I give tours, oftentimes we discuss this, that given that most Iraqis, um, Chaldeans or otherwise, who came from Iraq couldn't take anything with them. And you just explained how you had to leave everything behind. You had to come and become a businessman, something that wasn't in your field. But then we always found a way, we always found a way to build and just to, to start from zero. Um, and I think part of it is in our genes and our faith and just using whatever resources are available. And that's what they did in Mesopotamia. It's, it's really also like an example to inspire people to say, you know, no matter how, especially in this country, everything is available to us, but imagine um, communities that didn't have that available and they found ways. And I, I always find those inspiring. That's why I love to do these interviews. Um, I would like you to share a little bit about your trips to Nineveh, given you know what years did they take place and what changes did you see? Um, what were your feelings? Is there anything that you feel like you know uh, is gonna keep our connection to, to that area, whether now or in the future? Yes. Um... You know, since regime change in 203 um, and the traumas that uh, uh, followed, uh, in fact, uh, in 203, uh, 204, uh, I think it was in March, we, uh, I was one of the people that met uh, with uh, President Bush uh, at the time, uh, Bush the son, not the father. And, uh, you know, he asked us about, about Iraq because, you know, the Americans were going there with uh, really undefined strategy. So I told them, I said, uh, Mr. President, I'm just going to give you a little bit of history, a background. I said, you know, when the British came to Iraq in 1914, and uh, at first, you know, they came as liberators. 
and uh, they smelled oil in Kirkuk and they became occupiers. In 203, we cannot do the same. Uh, that experiment, which unfortunately ended in 1958, because really we are on the track of building a great nation and that the monarchy, uh, the Hashemites, but uh, that was zeroed in 1958. And I said, here we are as a consequence of that ugly day, uh, 14th of July, 1958, we cannot go to Iraq as you have been stating as liberators and we become occupiers. Well, that's exactly what they did. Well, the victims of that were the communities, the minorities, and one of the most crushed was the Christian community. Uh, now, we need to be selfish a little bit about this. Uh, the Christian community uh, was about a million and a half when I left Iraq in 1981. Uh, today, it's less than 150,000 at best, uh, according to, to reliable uh, reports. So, since 2004, I started going frequently to Iraq, uh, and mostly to the northern uh, region, and mostly to the Nineveh Plain area. And I saw the devastation and the demise of Christianity. You know, it's not just about population uh, shrinkage, demographic changes. It is beyond that. There is a squeeze. Unfortunately, many parties, including the Iraqi government, uh, that are participating in, and including the uh, kind of uh, careless approach by the superpowers, Britain, Iraq, France. The Christian areas in the Nineveh Plain, which is 1,640 kilometers, but they are, that's a very strategic area that strategy, stretches from uh, Al Qawash to Qar uh, This is the soft belly that divides Iraq, northern Iraq, the KRG region from uh, the uh, central government region. It's also the corridor that Iran wants because it takes its Iranian border all the way to the Mediterranean. And this is the soft belly because they cannot go through the Sydney uh, uh, provinces. They can go through the Christian provinces. We are the weak element. We and the Azidis and the Kakiais and uh, the people that reside historically for thousands of years in that area. The devastation that you see, as I said, it's not just demographic. Actually, they are squeezing every Christian out of their homes, their lands, their jobs. There's nothing is left for them. And the superpowers are just watching. I mean, it's like, well, it is what it is. Well, no, you know, you broke this glass. You have to fix it. Uh, and this is why many of us try to um, uh, find solutions, uh, whether they are short range, uh, or long-range uh, solutions. Uh, so uh, we realize that we cannot have a, a province uh, that is not in the cards. But you know, to have protected areas under the umbrella of superpowers, for example, where our Christian villages and our Christian community can not only just survive, but thrive, which means protection, security, economic development, and hopefully the survival of Christianity and the cradle of Christianity. So your um, visits were attempts to find solutions to what was going on over the, the years after the war? Well, first is to really assess, discover, listen, talk, and then find solutions. Um, because unless you really put this in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the proper fashion, it will fail again. Uh, it's not an easy task. It really, uh, we cannot bank uh, on others to really find solutions for us. We are the solution. So now being the solution, how do you get it done? Uh, you cannot get this done single-handed. We need international support. We need partners on the ground and we need protection. This is doable. This is, uh, and that's why we need to uh, raise the profile uh, of the uh, of uh, the tragedy uh, that and the genocide. I really call it a genocide uh, of the 21st century that occurred. In fact, I'm writing a series of articles. The first will appear in the next issue of the Chaldean News about the genocide of the 21st century. Uh, 
Uh, I didn't want to go back to 1914 to the Sifu genocide, which the Assyrians, Armenians, uh, this is during World War One. Uh, that is uh, covered uh, quite a bit, but really we need to document the genocide of the 21st century. So uh, the solutions lie within us. But, you know, we need to be smart about that. How do we connect to, to resources? Uh, how do we secure peace after we instill the peace there? How do we bring back over 40,000 people, uh, refugees that are in Turkey and Lebanon, neighboring countries back? They cannot come back to vacuum. Uh, there is a systematic, methodical process of acquiring their homes. Uh, this is backed up by Shiites militias. Uh, the government of Iraq is powerless when it comes to that. Uh, Iran is the major player. Uh, the Kurdish government is watching for its own reasons. We are the victims, but we are also the solution. And you have um, played a, a very important role here in the United States, in Michigan. And, you know, while you were traveling back and forth and assessing the situation over there, um, you've played a very important major roles in the community. Can you tell us a little bit about that, you know, meaning locally in Michigan? Yes, actually, you know, it's it's not really just me. It's, it's a combination of many good people uh, within our community uh, that advocate and, and uh, uh, try uh, to, to help. Uh, we have many people. We have, much of it is done uh, on an individual base, but we can't succeed on an individual base. We have to move institutionally. We have to move through organizations. Uh, we carry much heavier weight if we are uh, alone uh, in, uh, individuals. Uh, you know, we float together. Uh, we're like in a marina and, and, and we need to do that. Uh, we need our organizations. The church does a good job uh, on the spiritual end, uh, but the church has also real limitations. Uh, the secular people uh, need to, to move in and uh, the private sector people, people that have the capacity, the capability uh, to do that. So we need together uh, through our organization, through our institutions, to serve even the last Christian that's left in Iraq. It's a commitment. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So to do this, um, uh, many of our organizations are participating in this. The Chaldean American Chamber of Commerce is one, uh, but that's the uh, uh, economic arm, uh, which is very important, by the way, because we're trying to encourage investment in the Nineveh Plain region. Uh, we have the capacity and the ability on the outside. Uh, the people on the inside don't have it. So one of the things which unfortunately was derailed, we were going to open about two years ago uh, after I visited uh, the Nineveh Plain in 219, you asked me when was the last time, uh, five times. And it was decided then that we started working very closely with USAID, with American agencies, with international agencies, uh, to bring back uh, the Nineveh Plain uh, villages and towns uh, to the 21st century. And uh, we were going to open an office, which we're still planning to do, by the way, uh, and uh, also to tap into the international aid and resources that have been pouring, uh, but not properly administered, whether it is after the Pope's visit or even during the previous administration, the Trump-Pence, where they allocated 385 million for the region uh, for development. Uh, so it's a joint effort that we're trying uh, to, do, to do what we can, uh, but we have to do it um, in, in, as I said, in a smart way, and it has to begin with the economic development. Economic development leads to prosperity, to stability. Uh, it keeps our people rooted in the ground. I'm not saying they should all have only a single nationality and stay there forever. Uh, today, we live in the 21st century. People have different nationalities. Uh, look at the Lebanese. They live all over the world. But you know what? They pour back to, to their nation, Lebanon, every single year, whether they are physicians, lawyers, uh, business people. Look at the Israelis. Exactly the same thing. It is not difficult for us to duplicate that and make that commitment. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, it does give some hope that there are ways. It's just sometimes we're not so aware of them. And um, I mean, what is the best way for people to learn about these options if they want to participate? 
Well, uh, again, uh, we have to move uh, through institutions, organizations. So, for example, if it is something on the economic front, obviously the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, can lead that. If it's something on the humanitarian front, uh, then some uh, uh, something like the Chaldean uh, uh, Community Foundation, Shlama Foundation, uh, Ladies of Charity. We have many organizations that contribute uh, and help uh, the church uh, itself. Uh, and it is fundamental uh, for the educators and the, uh, the and the the uh, benchmarkers, the able people, to participate as well, uh, because education uh, is a critical element of success, uh, especially in the digital age that we live in. So it requires uh, really um, uh, engineering a, a group, uh, uh, large groups of people that are committed to the same goal. And not in short-term gains. This is not about making money. This is not about uh, becoming rich. It is about protecting our culture, preserving our history, hopefully. Thank you. Any last words? I mean, everything you've said is so beautiful, but any last words for the community? Three. We believe in the Trinity, as you know, the Father, uh, the Father, uh, the Mother and Holy Spirit, but uh, we also believe in, uh, uh, in, in our culture. Uh, we also have another tr trilogy. Uh, we always talk about, uh, when we talk about the Christian, uh, we, we talk about uh, faith and we talk about uh, food and we talk about family. That's another uh, trilogy. But my trilogy really, and my hope, is education, education, education. Well said. Thank you so much, Dr. Miri. And uh, we'll be in the future having Dr. Miri doing um, episodes that discusses the various topics that we discussed um, today, including Chaldeans around the world, um, the Chaldean history, and other interesting topics. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining I th us. I thank you. And uh, hopefully we can see you uh, soon. Yes. Thank you. Bye, everyone.